On June 24, 2023, a month-long fight between the Russian Ministry of Defense and Yevgeny Prigozhin, leader of the notorious private military company Wagner, escalated. Within a few hours, units of the Wagner Group crossed the border into Russia and occupied the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don, approximately 600 kilometers south of Moscow. Not only this, but other parts of the group began marching towards Russia's capital city just to hold their advance on Prigozhin's order several hours later. Social media quickly became flooded with spectacular images that reminded of the events in 2014 during the annexion of Crimea or the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. On the internet, voices quickly emerged, labeling the events as an escalating civil war until the announcement of a supposed deal between Prigozhin, the Russian military leadership and Putin was made. Military analysts and media outlets have reported extensively on the events, but what exactly led to the build-up and apparent escalation of the situation? In this video, we will try to look a little bit at the background of the event and what it tells us about the current state, not only in Russia, but on many other places on Earth. The so-called Wagner Uprising is the result of an internal power struggle between Wagner and the Russian Ministry of Defense. This became evident to the public for the first time during the Battle of Bakhmut. Back then, Prigozhin repeatedly criticized what he perceived as the incompetent approach of the Russian military leadership. He lamented the lack of ammunition supplied for his fighters. According to him, this heavily sea blocked their progress in a fiercely contested city. In his view, the Russian military leadership was being way too soft and needlessly wasted the lives of his fighters and also Russian soldiers. This led him to verbally confront the Russian defense minister Shoigu in multiple videos. Shoigu! Of course, Prigozhin is familiar with the inner workings of the Russian power apparatus and the leadership styles inherent with it. One of these could be best described as management by Darwin, pitting employees against each other, promoting the winner and eliminating the loser. Prigozhin may have realized that the increasing power and legitimization of his private army through military success eventually would become a problem for the Russian military leadership and that Putin himself might see him as a future threat to his own power position. As early as June 5, 2023, there were reports of escalating tensions between Wagner and the Russian military, culminating in the alleged arrest of a Russian officer by Wagner forces. This arrest was justified in a telegram post by the Wagner group, claiming that the officer had ordered an attack on Wagner soldiers during which a Ural truck was damaged when it was fired upon by Russian soldiers. Prigozhin is also aware of the fate of Jivia Motorola, two well-known Russian separatist leaders. Both men were leaders of quite successful paramilitary units that both forked in eastern Ukraine from 2014 onwards. They enjoyed quite a popularity among the pro-Russian side and both of these guys were assassinated under circumstances that remain unresolved to this day. One of the biggest advantages for those who employ private military services is also one of the greatest disadvantages for the service provider himself, namely being replaceable. Prigozhin saw this manifested when demands arose from the Ministry of Defense to regularize his Wagner Group and place it under the Russian military leadership on a contractual basis. Prigozhin responded to the demands and simply said that he won't follow Shoigu's orders. These tensions reportedly escalated in a rocket attack by the Russian military on Wagner camps, resulting in high losses. At this point, it became clear to Prigozhin that he was being sidelined and he publicly turned against the Russian Ministry of Defense in a speech that was to be regarded as an act of open rebellion. Soviet commander Wagner принял решение Зло, которое несет военное руководство страны, должно быть остановлено. Они пренебрегают жизнями солдат. Они забыли слово справедливость, и мы вернем ее. Поэтому те, кто уничтожили сегодня наших парней, те, кто уничтожили десятки, многие десятки тысяч жизней русских солдат, будут наказаны. Я прошу никому не оказывать сопротивление. Все, кто будут пытаться оказать это сопротивление, мы будем считать, что это угроза, и уничтожать немедленно, включая любые блокпосты, вставшие на нашем пути, любую авиацию, которую увидим над своими головами.
Я прошу всех сохранять спокойствие, не поддаваться на провокации, оставаться в своих домах. Желательно по маршруту нашего следования не выходить на улицу. После того, как мы закончим начатое, мы вернемся на фронт для защиты нашей Родины. Президентская власть, правительство, МВД, Росгвардия и другие структуры будут работать дальше в привычном порядке. Мы разберемся с теми, кто уничтожает русских солдат и вернемся на фронт. Справедливость в войсках будет восстановлена, а после этого справедливость для всей России. Пригожин's speech led to Russian authorities to issue an arrest warrant against him. Units of the Russian military were also deployed to Moscow to secure the city. Meanwhile, in the morning of June 24th, Prigozhin and his Wagner fighters began the takeover of the strategic important city of Rostov. Rostov serves as a major logistic hub for Russia's war in Ukraine. Within a few hours, Wagner fighters easily gained control of the city without significant resistance. They surrounded the headquarters of the Sota military district and gained access to it. We are in the staff at 7 o'clock 30 minutes in the morning under the control of the military objects in Rostov, in particular the aerodrome. On social media, a series of pictures and videos recorded by witnesses were shared showing a strong presence of heavily armed Wagner forces in and around the city. The shared images strongly resembled those of the so-called Little Green Man who appeared during Russia's annexion of Crimea in 2014. Putin strongly condemned Prigozhin's actions in his speech and announced countermeasures. Chechen leader Kadyrov expressed his loyalty to Putin and ordered the relocation of Chechen fighters from Ukraine to Rostov. In response, Wagner forces began mining the E-58 highway and started to set up roadblocks with vehicles to block any attempts to advance into the city. While this event unfolded, Wagner units already kept advancing north on the M4 highway towards Moscow to execute Prigozhin's plan of overthrowing the Russian military leadership. To slow down the Wagner columns, a series of roadblocks were established. Most of these roadblocks were makeshift roadblocks using only vehicles. The main plan of the Russian military was to stop the Wagner columns by using combat helicopters. The idea was to neutralize Wagner's equipment and combat capabilities through targeted airstrikes and a number of combat helicopters were dispatched to attack Wagner elements along the highway. The main effort of the Russian Air Force was documented in the city of Voronezh, about 520 kilometers south of Moscow. Videos appeared to confirm airstrikes carried out by KA-52 helicopters to which Wagner fighters responded with anti-aircraft fire in the form of missiles. Interestingly, Prigozhin's fighters were relatively well equipped with air defense capabilities in all their formations. In Rostov, video footage showed the group of Wagner fighters with at least three Igla man pads. And in the Voronezh region, video footage confirmed the presence of significant air defense in the form of Panzer and Strela surface-to-air missile systems. This fact led to the dawning of at least one Russian K-52 helicopter in Komitern, Soris of Voronezh. A video also circulated allegedly showing the dawning of a Russian aircraft of the EL-18 or EL-22 type. Reports suggest that up to eight Russian aircraft were shot down in total. During this, a fire broke out at an oil depot in Vorozne, but the cause cannot be determined solely based on the video material we saw. Eventually, the Russian Air Force was unable to stop the advance of the Wagner Group, and the fighters continued to push towards Moscow until at least Krasnitsky in Lipetsk Oblast, about 330 kilometers south of Moscow. In the meantime, Chechen forces had reached the outskirts of Rostov from two sides and all signs pointed towards escalation. The rapid advance towards Moscow came to a sudden halt when reports of a deal made between Prigozhin, the Russian Ministry of Defense, and Putin surfaced. This deal allegedly was mediated by Belarusian leader Lukashenko. The details of the deal remain unclear at this point but it is speculated that Prigozhin was guaranteed impunity, at least for now. He ordered his men to stop the advance, leave Rostov, and to return to their barracks. Video footage showed Wagner vehicles leaving Rostov in the night of June 24, while Chechen fighters moved into it. Prigozhin himself was also seen leaving the city in a black van, reportedly on the way to Belarus. 
His current whereabouts is actually unknown, also the exact contents of the alleged deal. One of the big questions from a military point of view now is how the Wagner Group could pull off such an openly announced move apparently so easily. How exactly could a relatively small force of only 25,000 men challenge one of the biggest military machines in the world? The first answer lies within Russia's lack of defense deep in their rear. Most of the defenses are located in depth on the front line on Ukraine and even there they are mostly concentrated around a number of strong points aiming at foiling Ukraine's breakthrough attempts. Russia and its borders are mostly not that heavily fortified, allowing infiltrators to easily slip through. The incidents in the Belgorod region already showed this. Back then a number of militias were able to advance several kilometers into Russia with nearly no problems. Also, there is a significant lack of training and willingness to fight within Russia's reserve forces. Wagner has shown that they are able to effectively coordinate their own logistics. They utilized one of the ground foundations of Russian military doctrine employed since the times of the Soviet Union, namely Tempo. They moved their heavier equipment via trucks on larger distance and only unloaded them when they had to. Also, they were effectively able to provide sufficient air cover for their advance that rendered the Russian air assets mostly useless. From the current knowledge as I am recording this, everything suggests a simple power play on Prigozhin's part as he felt Conrad. By publicly calling for rebellion, he followed the simple rule that states, don't build a fortress for your protection, isolation is dangerous. Through his public call and the swift offensive towards Moscow, he actively tried to maneuver himself out of his now increasingly marginalized role. I don't believe his actions were a direct coup attempt against Putin, but rather at least a photo of Ala Crimea 2014 aimed at showcasing what he perceived as the incompetence of the Russian military leadership. His forces probably would have reached Moscow a few hours later, given the pace they demonstrated, but it seems that the support from military groups sympathetic to his cause was still insufficient enough to achieve significant military success in the long term. However, prolonging the current status quo could have generated significant momentum for Ukraine and the escalation potential of this, however, is uncertain. If Prigozhin really is about to receive impunity, this would clearly demonstrate a condition that is increasingly evident globally in various aspects, namely anarcho tyranny. This term roughly translates to a stage of governmental dysfunction in which the state is anarchically hopeless at coping with larger matters but ruthlessly tyrannical in the enforcement of small ones. While not as severe as in this case, there are also paths in Western societies currently leading down that way, not to mention the conduct and rule enforcement of big tech companies who will definitely bring our societies to those stages, if not properly regulated through appropriate laws. Peer-to-peer -peer conflicts are one thing, but what is clear is that the trend of private actors increasingly openly challenging state authorities will continue. They are at least on pair with government actors, if already not surpassing them in know-how and through financial means. The war in Ukraine since 2014 has shown that the most successful actors had their backgrounds in private militaries and paramilitary formations. The famous Ukrainian Kraken Group of the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade all originated from widely privately funded volunteer militias that were incorporated into the armed forces structure. I don't want to delve too much into it now since this video is already quite long, but I think this will be a trend that will definitely continue. Government institutions are becoming more and more obsolete with each passing day and fail to offer attractiveness to combat this. Simple regulation through restrictive laws will not counter this without creating new tensions on other fronts. I say this now not judgmentally, but simply from a observing point of view. This event was definitely an interesting turn in the Ukraine war and could have more far-reaching consequences than anticipated so far. I honestly don't know what to think of it, but in my opinion Putin will not let Prigozhin go that easily. Because, as said, if he did, it would be the ultimate proof for the anarcho-tyrannical state Russia currently is in. That's it for the video. I hope I could provide the average viewer with an objective and reasonable picture of the current situation. I apologize for any grammatical errors or weird accent. I am not a native speaker, but I hope you could still follow along and I would really appreciate any likes and comments. 
you would also do me a great service by simply sharing this video. Currently YouTube is massively reducing my impressions. Neither the quality of the content or the engagement seems to matter. It seems that these reports are simply not meant to be seen on my channel but on other ones. By sharing we can generate external impressions and maybe fight against this unfair behavior. Also make sure to subscribe to this channel, hit the bell and turn on all notifications. This way you won't miss any more videos and it will motivate me to create more of these longer videos. You can also support me by buying me a simple coffee. That's my fuel that keeps me going through all the nights. The link is in the description. Thank you very much for watching. Till the next time.